Man. So you're there in Isaiah chapter 44. We're continuing our study through the book of Isaiah here. And in chapter 44, uh, we see some, some interesting things. It really is kind of picking up where it left off in chapter 43 with some, uh, some of the same thoughts. Um, but the first thing that we see here, notice what it says in verse 1. It says, Ye know, or I'm sorry, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, or just just Suran, whom I have chosen, and I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. So we see here, first of all, is that he's talking about Jacob, my servant, and Israel. Okay, so first of all, Jacob is a person. Okay, Jacob and Israel are the same person. Okay, so Jacob was his name, but then he was renamed or given the name Israel. Okay, and you probably remember the story of when he wrestled with the angel um, and, uh, you know, whether you believe that that was uh, an Old Testament, Old Testament parent, parents of Christ or not, that's not the, the, the case of what I, I'm trying to get across here. But if you remember, he wrestled with them all night long. And you remember that he changed his name and says, uh, you shall be called Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God. Okay, so uh, you can understand that it, it means basically a prince or someone that kind of has authority uh, with God, meaning that he has power to kind of, he's like, he basically wouldn't let him go unless he blessed him, you know, if you remember the story. Um, and so uh, he, he got that, that name, okay, uh, that was associated with it. So when it says, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, he could be talking about the physical person, uh, or he could be talking about uh, the seed of Israel, which I'm going to be getting to is talking about believers, okay? The, those that are chosen of God. Those are cho- God's chosen people, okay? Now, look at uh, verse uh, 2 there. It says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And that's just another name, uh, basically, to mean, like, upright, or, or basically another name for that, per- that same person, okay? And... Later on, it basically talks about how there's other people that are going to take that surname, okay? So we're talking about people that aren't even of Israel that are basically saying, I'm going to be a part of that. And go to Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, and this gets into uh, what the Bible calls in Galatians 6, the Israel of God, the Israel of God. And so, um, and if you remember, there's so many scriptures on this, and we kind of hit it on last week, um, in the fact that though the, the, the children of Israel the number of the children of Israel be as the sand on the seashore, a remnant shall be saved. And so there's only a remnant actually, actually believers that are actually children of God. And in Romans chapter 9 hits on the same fact that just because you're children of Abraham, that doesn't mean you're children of God. Because the children of, fre- of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of uh, promise are counted for the seed. Okay, And so that means the children of promise talking about Isaac and talking about the fact that it's through Isaac and that promise. Uh, and so it's not just because you're physically of Israel, but because you're actually a believer. Because if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay. But I want you to see this idea of the Israel of God. And this is where people are like, you're teaching replacement theology. You're teaching uh, supersessionism. You know, that's the, the fancy... Uh, you know, theological term for replacement theology, which just basically means that the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament, uh, which makes sense, okay? If you take it away the first, they may establish the second. Uh, yeah, you could call it take, take it the way theology, um, you know, but that's pretty much what it is. Um, but all I'd say is that, listen, the Israel of God or the spiritual Israel um, has always been there, okay? Does that make sense? Meaning that uh, even in the Old Testament, when you had the nation of Israel, you still had the spiritual nation of Israel that was there. 
what the New Testament is stating is that that physical nation is no longer regarded at all in the fact that they're not even physically uh, being looked at as God's people because they're keeping the ordinances and, you know, as a nation, uh, God's people. He's not recognizing that anymore in the New Testament. He just recognizes those that are saved, whether Jew or Greek. So Galatians chapter 6 here, notice in verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. It says, For in Christ, or I'm, I'm sorry, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule. Now, let me ask you a question. What rule are we talking about? Okay. When it says, as many as walk according to this rule, he's calling back to the verse that we just got done reading. Okay. So the rule is that those that are in Christ Jesus are a new creature. Okay. So those are who we're talking about here. So as, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. And, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Okay. Now this isn't going to be a whole sermon on, uh, you know, is you know the fact that we're fellow citizens with Israel. We were alienated and we we're you know cut off from the commonwealth of Israel, but now we're fellow citizens with the saints. Uh, you can look at Ephesians two for your homework to really see that. Um, but go to First Peter chapter two just to kind of hit on this really quick. Is that when it says that Israel, whom I have chosen. Uh, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, and then it says that there's going to be even others that are going to say, hey, I'm going to sermon name myself Israel, okay? And today, you know, I can, I can take that promise. And listen, back in the Old Testament, people could take that promise too, because you didn't have to be of the physical seed of Abraham or of Israel to become, you know, a part of that nation back then. You can choose to be a part of that nation, and they have to treat you as if you're you're born in the land. And that, that scripture is in the, 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 uh, the books of, of the law, but it's also in Ezekiel as they're coming back into the land, rebuilding the temple. So uh, that's true. But, uh, but in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because today people want you to think, well, when it says, you know, chosen and the elect, that's talking about the Jews. Now, I want you to show me where did it say Jews in Isaiah 44, by the way. Because it didn't say Jews. It said Israel. And it said Jacob. And it said Jeshurun, right? So it's, it's, it's not talking about the Jews, which, by the way, is Judah in that southern kingdom of Judah, right, or Judea. Um, obviously, Judah is of Israel, okay, so don't get me wrong. And, and obviously Judah's one of the, the 12 patriarchs. Um, but all that to say is that it's stating here that we are, or ye are, a chosen generation and holy nation. Well, who are we talking about here? Well, verse 10 there, it says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It is crystal clear that we're not talking about those that are physically Israelites. Okay? Don't believe me? Go to the very first verse of the book of 1 Peter. And it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. By the way, that's not in Israel. Okay, just so you know, Asia is not in Israel. And uh, Bithynia is not in Israel. And Galatia is not in Israel. And it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience of the sprinkling, and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So, <laughs> we're talking about those that are of these countries that are of this chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and it says, an holy nation. Okay? Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And you know, that's why it says, as many as walk according to this rule, which is what? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. You know what he's talking about? Jews or Gentiles, <laughs> okay? Doesn't matter because in Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. We're all one in Christ, and that middle wall of partition has been broken down, okay? But even back in the Old Testament, you still had that separation, okay? Meaning that you had the Jew, which is one outwardly, right? But then you had the Jew, which is one inwardly, right? Because circumcision is, is not outward in the flesh, but is the circumcision of the heart, right? That really matters, okay? 
because you could be circumcised in the flesh, but that doesn't mean anything spiritually speaking. And you know, there's tons of people that are going down to the pit with the uncircumcised. Okay, as it says in Ezekiel. You're like, why are you talking about Ezekiel? Don't worry, we're going to get to Ezekiel this Sunday. <laughs> so, Lord willing, right? Um, so, uh, but go, go down to, uh, you know, in that same passage in Isaiah 44 there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of just harp on that a little bit, that we're talking about others coming in and subscribing to the Lord and saying, I'm going to surname myself Israel. Why? Because they believed on the Lord. They put their faith in the Lord, and they are a part of that chosen seed. Okay, that seed of promise. Notice what it says in verse 3 here. It says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, and as willows by the water courses. If you remember when we were going through uh, Jeremiah on, on Sunday, I kind of mentioned there was a verse in Isaiah that, that kind of links into the fact of what I was talking about with you know, the Lord is the fountain of living waters and that he's going <clears> to, <throat> you know, that the soul shall be satisfied with water. You know, in that, those verses I was showing you in Jeremiah, this is the verse I was talking about that is very closely related to that. The pouring of water to the thirsty uh, soul, if you will. Um, it doesn't say soul there, but it says, but I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. And you can see the, the, the correlation of uh, the water being poured and the, the spirit there. Um, but go to John chapter 4 just to show you that. John chapter 4 and verse 13. John chapter 4 and verse 13. And the idea of obviously water giving life, and the Spirit gives life. Okay, The Spirit of God, it says the, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, right? Not, you know, uh, but after the, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so when we get saved, there's obviously this washing of regeneration that happens spiritually. We're baptized, you know, with him in death. You know, there's this spiritual baptism that happens. We're crucified with him. We're circumcised with him. You know, like all these, these pictures that, that go on spiritually um, that don't happen physically. And in John chapter 4 and verse 13, this is obviously the woman at the well and uh, you know, Jesus is, uh, you know, asking for a drink. And notice what it says in verse 13. It says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And you can definitely see how that correlates here, where it says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass and as willows by the water courses. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a spiritual drink here. We're talking about the, spirit, the spiritual drink that Jesus is going to give you that you'll never thirst again. Okay? And there's many verses on this as far as, you know, uh, he that is a thirst, let him take of the water of life freely. And just that idea of the water of life, the everlasting life, and how that's springing up. And, and obviously we touched on this, but John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verse 37, we touched on this on Sunday night, uh, dealing with the Jeremiah passage. Uh, but the same thing, dealing with this water and how that's equated with the Spirit. Okay, so it's interesting how it's doing that here in chapter 44. So Isaiah 44, verse 3, how it's, it's basically giving you a picture of water uh, fulfilling thirst and then the spirit being poured on his seed, right? And so how that, that, that correlates. And Jesus obviously correlates that here in John 7, verse 37. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So, you know, it, it's stating here that it's showing you this, this uh, relation to water being a thirst, but then the Spirit, or this living water, if you will, and the fact that God is called the fountain of living waters. 
Okay? And so this is that other verse that if you wanted to couple that uh, with John 4, John 7, and then Jeremiah, and then Isaiah 44 here, and how all those, those verses work together there. Okay? Now, another thing to think about, which I don't want to get in too depth because this is in Isaiah, good Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, because obviously John 7 is talking about a New Testament thing that's coming, right? Because obviously, spiritually speaking, people uh, you know, that got saved in the Old Testament, uh, it talks about in whose spirit is no guile in Psalm 32. Okay? So we know that their souls were purified. We know that they were born again, right? Because Jesus rebuked Nicodemus for not knowing that. He's like, art thou a master of Israel and knows not these things? And he's talking about being born again. So that's obviously a, a, a concept that, that's before the New Testament as well. So being born again, your spirit being perfect, uh, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. All that stuff applied before. But what didn't apply in the Old Testament is the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And that's what John 7 is, is stating, is that when Jesus is glorified, then the Comforter's coming, and he's, he's with you, but he's also going to be in you. Okay? And that's the difference. That's a big difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, and one of the great things about the New Testament is the fact that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost and the fact that the Holy Ghost is living inside of us in the New Testament. And I, if you remember, and I'm going to hit on this obviously more when we get to this chapter, but Jeremiah 31 is the passage that talks about the New Covenant. Okay, The Old Testament, you know, scripture that's quoted off in Hebrews saying that I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But Isaiah 59 is also talking about the New Covenant. And you can see how it relates okay, to what we're seeing here with the Spirit being poured upon His people and the fact that it, it, you know, it's likened unto water and, and how John 7 likens it unto water and how it's the Spirit that's, that's uh, you know, springing up uh, you know, as living waters in their belly and all this. Now, uh, Isaiah 59 and verse 20, it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, said the Lord, As for me... This is my covenant with them, said the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy, of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, said the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Okay. Now, you can obviously see how that covenant and the Redeemer that's going to come to Zion is going to be talking about the New Testament. And, and I don't want to get too far into that because I'm going to really hit that hard. I'm going to really explain what that passage is saying in Isaiah 59, but that's not the chapter we're in today. But I do want you to see that you can see how it's talking about his spirit being upon thee and his words being in thy mouth and that that, that spirit and the word's going to be in the mouth of thy seed and the mouth of thy seed seed forever. Okay, And so just that, that how that correlates here with Isaiah 44. So we'll get back to that when we get to that chapter. So you have a few more weeks until we get there, but um, I'm really going to hit that hard. So I don't want uh, to spend any time on that because when we get to that chapter, that, those two verses right there are going to be preached. <laughs> don't worry. So Because that is a passage that needs to be explained uh, because there's a bunch of Zionists out there. Uh, go back to Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. And we're going to see another passage where God is saying he's, he's the only God. Okay? So in the last chapter, we saw where it kept saying, you know, like, he's the only Savior. Beside me, there is no Savior. Okay? And here it's harping on the fact that there is no God beside him, and which is said in chapter 43. Um, so it's, it's not like we weren't seeing that. Um, but if you remember that uh, he said, there was no God formed before me, and there's no God formed after me in chapter 43. Uh, but he's going to say it a little different here, and, and I love that he does because it's really just throwing out all doubt what we're talking about. So Isaiah 44 and verse 6 here says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have, and have declared it? 
Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So I love the, the, this verse or this passage because, you know, the, the fact is, is that uh, people that, especially the Mormons, I think of the Mormons more so than anything in this, because they're always constantly trying to state, well, you know, when it says there's only one God, it just means of this universe. Okay. And so, you yeah. and, and so they try to, so when, when you go up to a Mormon, you know what they're going to say? You'll be like, well, we believe there's only one God. And they're like, well, we believe that too. They're like, well, no, you don't. You believe you can become gods or, or that, you know, there was gods before that and, and, you know, all that. And they'll just constantly deny it, deny it, deny it. I'm like, listen, I'm not talking about just this universe. I'm talking about everywhere, anywhere in any type of universe, planet, you know, space continuum. I don't care what you're talking about. There's no other God but Jesus, okay, and the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you finally will pin them down on this, you know, and it'd be like, what about Kolob? What about, you know, uh, you know get on to this, this, this whole thing about you know, these other gods? And what they'll say is like, well, you know, the Bible says there's only one God, but that's just talking about to us, you know, or it's just talking about, you know, yeah, in this world, there's only one God, uh, but in other worlds, there's other gods, okay? Well, riddle me this, if God says, there was no God formed before me, nor shall there be any God formed after me, how are you going to become a God? And how is there any gods that are on other planets? And, and riddle me this, if God says, there is no God, you know, it says, is there a God beside me? He's asking a question. Is there a God beside me? And it says, there is no God. I know not any. Okay. So, It'd be kind of ridiculous if Elohim was like uh, the, the father of all these spirit babies that came down and became men and then become gods of all these galaxies, but he's like, I don't know any of the gods. You know, that's pretty ridiculous. So these are verses that just annihilate that theory, okay? Or that idea of like, well, I'm not talking about in this area, I'm talking about this. And, uh, and listen, if they're just like, well, no, I still think that's just talking about this area right here in this planet right now, then you know what? I don't know what to tell you. You know, uh, you can't just beat your head against the wall against somebody that just doesn't want to believe what the Bible teaches and just wants to believe their fake religion and their heretical garbage of Joseph Smith looking into it, looking at his golden tablets and talking about his lunacy when it comes to the Book of Mormon. And uh, but another thing that I see here, and we kind of touched on this before. It says, I am the first and I am the last. Now, if you remember before, we saw where it said, I am the first and I am with the last, right? And how that correlated in the fact that in the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so you kind of see the fact that when, when it says the first and the last, and I'm going to prove this to you, when you say the first and the last, that could be applying to the Father, that could be applying to the Son, or that could be applying to the Holy Ghost, or they could just be talking about the whole Godhead as a whole, okay? Meaning that it's the you know, God, the Trinity is the first, the last, okay? But as we saw in previous, in our previous sermons, uh, in the fact that I am the first and I am with the last, and you can show the, the fact of that two different persons there. You had the first that's sending the last, right? That's sending the Lord Jesus and how that works together. But I want to, I want to prove to you in, in Revelation, go to Revelation chapter one, Revelation chapter one, that Jesus is the first and the last. Now, why is that important? Because it says, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So this is a great passage to show someone that Jesus is God. Okay, So it's always good to have this passage, you know, have it memorized. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And then go to this passage in Revelation to show about Jesus being the first and the last. But first of all, I want to show you all the places where it says, because Revelation it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, okay? So really, it's, it's all these three ways of saying the same thing, right? What's Alpha and Omega, okay? Alpha and Omega are the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek al alphabet. It'd be like if you did it in English, you'd be like, I am the A and the Z, right? Pretty simple. And then it says, I am the beginning and the ending, okay? Beginning, ending, A, Z, or, you know, Alpha, Omega, right? But then you have, uh, you know, the first and the last, right? So you can see how the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, like you're pretty much saying the same thing. Um, obviously, it's a little different in the way you'd word it. Um, 
But uh, go there to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, and I just want you to see this. Because here's the thing. If Jesus is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, he's God. Okay? And you know what? The Jehovah Witnesses will say, well, he's God. He's the mighty God, but he's not the almighty God. Okay? Well, this verse will put, him to, uh, put it to bed here. That's what it says in, in Revelation 1 and verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay? Now, I'm sure there's some Jehovah Witness out there that, well, that's just, that's the God the Father talking there. Okay? Okay, well, if I prove to you that Jesus is at the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, then that should put that to bed, right? Okay, if I show you a clear verse that says that. But first, let me show you that he's the first and the last. Okay? Go down to verse 17. Verse 17. So I'm just going to take you in order here in Revelation of when the, these uh, phrases are mentioned. But notice what it says in verse 17. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. You say, Well, who's this talking about? It says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. This is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, if you read between verse 8 and verse 18, it would be abundantly clear that you're seeing a man like unto the son, you know, a son of man, standing there with flames of fire in his eyes, you know, his feet are like polished brass, you know, all this stuff that's describing the Lord Jesus. But if you had any doubt, I am he that liveth and was dead. You know, why is this verse so important? Because... You know, there's people out there that don't want to believe that Jesus went to hell, okay? I happen to believe the King James Bible when it says, His soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. I happen to believe that. I happen to believe when he says that, he, that he's going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, just like Jonah, when Jonah says, Out of the belly of hell cried I, and I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and her bars was about me forever. I happen to believe that when it says that. But Jesus was also dead for three days and three nights, and it wasn't just his body. Now, his body definitely was dead, but his soul was in hell where the dead are, okay? And there's not this holding chamber of people that are alive down in hell before Jesus went down there, okay? Like he preached unto these people that were down there and brought, led captivity captive in this weird doctrine that people have convolutedly said. But they'll say, well, it wasn't God who died. God didn't die. The first and the last was dead. And by the way, the first and the last, it says, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So guess who died? Guess who was dead? God. So if that's the case, then God can die. And you say, well, how can God die? I don't know. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I don't know. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Do you believe the Bible or not? And you can philosophize that away and be like, well, how in the world can deity die? He did. And by the way, that was the only way that you're going to get saved. So you can say, well, I, I don't understand it. Good. Fine. I don't care if you understand it. It's what it says. Okay. It's just like the Calvinist out there that wants to say, well, why would Jesus die for people that he knew wouldn't believe on him? Because he's just God because he's not willing that any should perish, because he wanted them all to get saved. And by the way, they're all without excuse. When all those people that don't believe on him and don't put their faith on him die and go to hell, they can't say, well, it wasn't offered. It wasn't available. No, it was available. You rejected it, and you're going to go to hell. And you can try to use some kind of weird, like, oh, that's double jeopardy, brother. You know, that's double jeopardy. They didn't actually, uh, you know, he's paying for the, the, the same crime twice. No, actually they're not. The person that goes to hell is paying for once. You know, Jesus paid for the crime, but the person isn't paying for it twice. Double jeopardy is you as a person being tried for the same crime twice. Okay? And by the way, double jeopardy, let me just stick on this because I'm not a lawyer, but double jeopardy is where you're acquitted of your crime and you can't be tried for the same crime with the same evidence twice. That's double jeopardy. Okay? But when were these people ever acquitted? You know, they didn't believe on Christ. 
That's the condition, by the way, not unconditional atonement or unconditional election, whatever. Limited atonement, uncondi- who cares? The whole tulip needs to be plucked up by the roots, okay? But let me just, I just wanted to park it there for a second. But I do want to, I want to, I want to make that very clear, okay? When Jesus died, his body died and his soul died, okay? And, you know, when he gave up the ghost, I believe his, his soul, his spirit left his body and left his soul, and they were both dead, okay? That doesn't mean that he was out of existence, okay? As some people want to weirdly say, you know, like, well, you're saying that he went out. Of, who said that? The people that go to hell, are we saying they're out of existence? Are they conscious? Because the rich man was so much that he said, you know, I, you know send over Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and, you know, and cool my tongue. So they're obviously conscious. And conscious to the point where you're prophesying about Jesus being in hell in Jonah chapter 2. And he's talking about out of the belly of hell cried I and the, you know, the earth with her bars was about me forever. I mean, that's being conscious. You understand what's going on, okay? And so this really puts it to bed. First, this shows you that Jesus is God. Second, this shows you that God can die, which he did, okay? The Son of God, by the way, died, not the Father, okay? The Father didn't die on the cross, and the Holy Ghost didn't die on the cross, okay? Jesus died on the cross, and you had to, you know, understand that the Trinity is there. Now, go to verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 8, just to show you the same thing there. I just want to show you that it actually says it twice, that the first and the last died. Okay, so if you didn't get it first in chapter 1, you'll get it in chapter 2, verse 8 there. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Okay, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how else you can... Uh, Unless you're going to tell me the first and the last is just the body. That's just the human part. By the way, the body was God too. Because it's God manifest in the flesh. He's all God. Okay? But he's also all man. That, listen, great is the mystery of godliness without controversy. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? Obviously, it's a mystery to understand that Jesus Christ is God fully. But he's also man, fully, okay? And to try to just pick him apart and be like, well, that's the God part. That's the, that's the body, you know, that's the human part. No. His body's God. His soul's God. His spirit's God. And everything also is man, okay? And it's a great mystery, but, you know, thank God he could do that for us, okay? So, but go to uh, Revelation. I, I told you I was going to prove to you. So you see here that the first and the last is definitely Jesus, right? And the first and the last is definitely God. Okay, so that means, that means, means, good night. I'm like a hiccup here. That means, that means that the first and the last, you know, <laughs> that means that, that Jesus is God. Okay. Now, go to uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 1, 21. Now, if I was going to prove that Jesus is God, do I go to this passage usually? Not off the bat. Okay, usually I'm going to Hebrews chapter 1. But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Or I'm going to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Those are my go-to. But, you know what, if they're going to still be belligerent on that, I'd be like, all right, well, the first and the last, it says, the first, I am the first I am, and, and the last, and beside me there is no God. And what's it say here? I am the first and the last, and I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. Okay? And so, and I've showed people that, and it's just like, yeah. Now, other times I'll maybe go to John 17, where it says, you know, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Or I'll go to John 8, where it says, before Abraham was, I am. You know, there's a a lot of places you could go to, but this isn't my go-to, like, you know, first thing. First off the bat, let me show you that Jesus is God. We're going to go to Isaiah 44. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 1, and I'm going to prove this to you, okay? Um, but in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5 here, notice what it says. And he that sat upon the throne said. Now, what I want you to point out, I want you to realize here is that he that sat on the throne, that obviously is God the Father, okay? So if you're, if you're paying attention through Revelation, you have him that sitteth on the throne, and then you have the lamb coming up to him that sitteth on the throne and takes the book out of his hand, 
and or you have he that sits on the throne and Jesus is at the right hand of him that sits on the throne. And so um, we're talking about God the Father, okay? It says, Behold, I, I make all things new. And he said unto, unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of, of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So here's another reason why this is God the Father, okay? Because uh, we're brethren with Christ, you know, the Son of God, but we're sons of God to the Father, okay? And so uh, I believe this is very clearly talking about God the Father saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, okay? I don't think anybody would doubt that or question that, you know? I've never had anybody be like, well, Jesus is out, the Alpha and Omega, and he's the first and last. He's God, but I don't know about God the Father. You know, like that, that'd be, I've never had anybody say, like, God the Father is not God. So I want you to see how it's used for God the Father, but I'm going to show you in Revelation 22 that it's clearly talking about God the Son. Okay? So Revelation 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22 and verse 12. It seems like you're preaching a whole sermon about Jesus is God. Yeah, well, we are in the passage about talking about there's only one God, and he's the first and the last, and Jesus called himself that. So, yeah, of course I'm going to go to that. Um, but I think this is very important to, to understand that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, and the first and the last. Okay, He's not just the first and the last. Um, but also, I believe those are all the same. It's not the same thing. Don't, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying like that shouldn't have said that. It should just say the first and the last. What I'm saying is it's reiterating the same point is, is what I'm trying to say there. But in Revelation 22 and verse 12 here, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Okay. Now you say, well, I come quickly. Maybe that's the Father. Okay. Well, first of all, that'd be weird. Okay, because throughout the whole Revelation, it's talking about Jesus coming quickly. But just to put the nail in the coffin, when it's talking about I, I come quickly and I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the, the first and the last, notice what it says in verse 20 of Revelation 22. And he which testified these things said, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Okay, so let's talk about someone coming quickly. Who are we talking about? The Lord Jesus. And who did Jesus say that he was? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, and it says the first and the last. Okay, So we see God the Father calling himself the Alpha and Omega, and we see God the Son calling himself the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, what do we see? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty. Okay, Well, God the Father is Almighty, and God the Son is Almighty, and God the Holy Spirit is Almighty. The Trinity is Almighty. Okay, so these are terms that can be used for any person of the Trinity, okay? Just like all caps, Lord Jehovah is one of those names. Um, Ancient of Days, which I'm not getting into tonight, but in, in Daniel it talks about the Ancient of Days. It talks about the Son of Man coming unto the Ancient of Days, but then it also talks about the Ancient of Days coming in the clouds. Okay, so, um, you know, it's a term that obviously God is the Ancient of Days, Okay. Um, so there's terms like that. God obviously is one of those terms that uh, any person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, or the Holy Ghost can attach himself to that. Um, but there are certain names that are only to one of them, okay? Like the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Ghost, okay? Those are names, those are titles, you know, names that, that are theirs and only theirs, okay? Now go to Revelation, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 9. Isaiah 44 and verse 9. Every time I preach on that Trinity, I feel like I get a thumbs down on YouTube. I, I feel like there's just this modalist out there that anytime I talk about the Trinity, they just get, you know, triggered. I don't know what, what it is, but I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if people are triggered in this room when it comes to the Trinity. Um, it's a doctrine that needs to be defended. It's, it's something uh, that is under attack. And listen, in the end times, I do believe it's going to be a, a catalyst to the Antichrist. Okay? Because Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. 
Okay. And what does that mean? Meaning that he's not going to say that I'm coming from someone else. I'm not coming from God. I am, you know, like there's only, you know, the, the idea is an anti-Trinitarian God, which, by the way, is what the Jews believe, which, which is what the Muslims believe, right? And so uh, you're going to get into and modalism or this oneness idea is creeping in the churches. It's creeping in the Baptist churches. It's creeping into, you know, and there's going to be a, a falling away. There's going to be a departing of the faith in the last times. And I believe that doctrine of being against the Trinity is going to creep in, and that's going to set up for the Antichrist saying, oh, you know, you guys believe in some polytheism stuff. No, we believe in the one true God, one person. But the Bible, obviously, has been teaching Trinity since Genesis 1. And so um, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a doctrine that needs to be defended often, uh, and especially as we go towards the end times. Um, and you say, well, are we going to be in it you know, in our lifetime? Well, we're one day closer, one year closer than we were before. So I don't know, but you know what? It's better to be prepared anyway. Uh, Isaiah 44 and verse 9 here, dealing with idolatry. I love this passage because this passage is really showing you the foolishness of idolatry. Now, there's a lot of passages in the Bible that do that. But I love this because I love how God is showing the, 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 the lack of logic. Okay, And go to uh, verse 9 there. But I first want, I want you to <laughs> think of Isaiah 1.18. Now, this is a, a famous passage dealing with uh, your sins being a scarlet and all that. We even have a song that's, that's about that. Um, but it says in Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Okay. But the, the key that I want you to see there is that God is saying, Come, let us reason together. Let me reason with you right? Let's use some logic, right? And in this passage, I believe God is just like, just let me reason with you here, because this doesn't make sense what you're doing, okay? Notice what it says in verse 9. It says, they that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not, not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know they, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. And the thing that I see at the first one, we're talking about people that make idols, and the whole idea of being these craftsmen of idols, is that they're going to be ashamed. Okay. And the Bible says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay? And I believe what that's talking about is the fact that he's not going to let you down. Okay? When Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, and you put your faith in that, you're not going to be let down. You're not going to be ashamed. Meaning, like, people are going to look at you and be like, you trusted in God. He didn't save you. That would be shame, right? You'd be ashamed to think that you trusted in a God that couldn't save. Okay? And obviously, we're not going to be ashamed because our sins are forgiven, but I don't believe that's what it's talking about. Because when it says, he shall not make haste, he shall not be ashamed, he shall not be confounded, all three of those terms are used to talk about he that believeth on him, obviously, shall be saved. But it's talking about the fact that we're not going to be ashamed because we know he's actually going to deliver us. He's actually going to save us. He's actually going to help us. But these idols can't do that. Okay? And they're going to be ashamed of that. The idols that they're trusting in are going to make them ashamed because they're not going to perform that which they thought they, they would. Okay? So I see that first of all in here. Verse 12 here says, The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule and marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes and he marketh it out with the compass and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. Okay? So the first thing that you have to see here is that he's making a point that a person that literally has to eat and drink or they'll die, okay, is making a god. You see how stupid this is? Okay, think about it. 
Okay? This God that's supposed to deliver you is made by somebody that has to eat and drink or they'll faint or fall over or they perish if they didn't eat and drink. Okay? So the maker of the God is, is not a God. Okay? So just reason would tell you that's dumb. Okay? So God is made by someone that's inferior to it. Okay? So that alone, you should be thinking right, that that doesn't make sense. Uh, and they're making it into the, the, the figure of a man. Okay? Acts talks about this, that think not that the Godhead would be likened unto you know, gold or silver or you know, anything graven with wood. Okay? But keep reading there in verse 14, because he's going to give this illustration or this idea. You know, basically, he's, just, he's telling them what they're doing and saying, how does this make sense? Okay? How, how, do, how are you doing this and not realizing how dumb this is? And I put it in modern vernacular. Obviously, God didn't say it that way. But it says uh, <clears throat> in verse, uh, where did I stop there? Uh, verse 14. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. it uh, nourish it. So he's talking about different types of trees, like cedars, cypress, oak, ash, those are all types of tree or types of wood, right? And he's basically stating that you're planting it and the rain is nourishing it, okay? So literally this tree needs all this help, right? It needs some of the planet, it needs the rain to nourish it. And then it goes on and says, then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and fall down there too. Okay? So in this one verse here, he's showing you the, the, the lack of logic, the lack of reason. He's like, you take the wood and you burn it. You're burning it for fire to bake your food on, and then you're making a god with it. It's like, what? how in the world can that be a god if you're like literally burning it and consuming it to make food on it? Okay? But he's going to explain that. Okay, that's essentially what, what this passage is stating is that don't, don't you see the folly here? That one part you're burning it and, and you're baking food on it, and the other part's like your God that created you and delivers you out of everything. So <clears throat> it says in verse 16, he burneth part thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eateth flesh, he roasteth, he roasteth roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. Do you see how stupid this is? Right? It's like, imagine cutting down a tree. And like, part of it, you're like, you're chopping it up, and you're like, putting it into the fire, you're baking your cake on it, and you're like, this other part of it, like, bowing down to it, and saying, you're going to deliver me from all my enemies. Do you see how dumb that is? Like, how in the world does that make any sense? <laughs> and uh, keep reading there. It says, uh, where did I stop reading? Um, yeah, verse 17. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his grain and image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. Notice from verse 18. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. Did that, is that another reprobate verse? You know, I'm not trying to find them, by the way. We're just going through the book of Isaiah right here. But if you remember how this started off with those that make graven images, we're talking about people that make graven images. It says, at the very, verse 9 there, it says, uh, they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. And then it goes down here to say that these people that are making these, it says, they have not known nor understood, but... He hath shut their eyes that they cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes and deceiveth his heart, I'm sorry, and his deceived heart had turned himself aside that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? He literally can't say, like, no, we're talking about someone that doesn't even know that there's a lie in his right hand. He doesn't even know that he's lying. 
You know what you're, you're dealing with? The fact that he has a seared conscience. And you say, well, how does this relate to a reprobate mind? Read Romans 1. It's talking about making graven images. It's talking about uh, worshiping the creature more than the creator and bow, you know, things that are four-footed beasts and all these different things that it's talking about and worshiping the hosts of heaven. It's talking about idolatry. And it talks about how God gave them up unto that. You know, to worship the host of heaven, it says in Psalms. And so this is just showing you, and I, and I love this because it's really just showing you how foolish idolatry is. And the fact that you look at this like man-made image, and you're like, that's a god. Yeah, and there, people are kissing it, people are bowing down to it, they're burning incense unto it. And literally from the same exact tree they took to carve that thing out, they cut it up, put it in the fire, and made their food on top of it. Or they just warmed themselves and said, aha, I have seen the fire, you know. Like, it's just foolishness. And I love how the Bible does that because it really just shows you that God's just saying, hey, let's reason about this. Let's think about this logically. But there are people out there that are unreasonable. Okay. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And that's what he's basically stating here is that they have not known nor understood for the... He has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. So he's basically saying these people can't even understand this. They can't even like recognize how foolish it is that the same tree that you're cutting down to make a god, you're using to make your food and you're consuming it. And, and, and the, you know, the people that are making it are people that need food and need drink. And you're saying that you're making a god? You know, for some, and someone inferior is making something superior to them as far as, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense logically. You know what makes sense is God is superior to us and he made us who are inferior. Okay, that makes sense. That's logic. Okay, something more powerful made us, you know. We're not making something more powerful than us, you know, as far as making a God. Okay, we made who created us. Does that make logical sense? We created our creator. But see, that's the foolishness that goes through these reprobates' heads. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 1, and that's what you got to realize is that there are certain people that are just unreasonable. You can't reason with them. Okay. And I'm not saying if you go out soul winning and someone doesn't get saved that you're like, well, they're unreasonable. <laughs> you know, like if someone doesn't agree with you, <laughs> You try to show them something, they're like, yeah, I don't agree with you. Are you unreasonable reprobate? Like, I'm not saying that, okay? But there are people that literally don't have, they, they just have lost the capacity to reason, to logic, okay? And in verse 1 here, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith, Okay? So this is actually something I pray often. You know, when we go out soul winning, I'm always praying that the, his word would have free course and that we'd be delivered from unreasonable or wicked men. What I'm praying for are to deliver us from any type of reprobate that's out there that would try to stop us or try to hinder the word of God. You know, kind of like uh, Bar Jesus, you know, the sorcerer, or Limus, you know, the sorcerer that was trying to keep the, the deputy from believing. You know, that's the type of thing, you know, the, the, the child of the devil, you know, full of all subtlety and wickedness, right? Um, but uh, it says, all, for all men have not faith, okay? Why? Because, you know, go, go to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, I want you to see this. Because, again, when you look at this verse, um, <clears throat> you know, the Calvinist is going to try to devour that and say, see, not everybody has the ability to believe. Now, I'd, you could say, well, it's just saying that not all, all men are believers, okay? And I can understand where you're coming from with that. I'm not, you know, against you if you believe that. I believe this goes a little deeper, though, than just saying not all men believe. Um, I believe you're dealing with unreasonable and wicked men, people that lack the, the, the ability to reason, but they also do not, uh, the, 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 their faith has been taken away from them, meaning that they, they have lacked or been, it's been taken away the ability to believe, okay? And this goes into, in, uh, in 2 
Timothy chapter 2, where it says, Per adventure, God will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. Okay? Meaning that that can be taken away. Or he's granted unto them repentance uh, unto life, right? It talks about an axe. And so there's certain people that it's not granted anymore. There's certain people that he is not uh, giving that to anymore. The, abil the ability, okay, to believe. But I want you to know this, that everybody had that ability at one time. It says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay? Every man. So I believe every man has the opportunity to believe. Okay? But there are certain people that says all men have not faith. And I believe there's a certain point where that can be taken away. And you say, what, is, what do you mean? We'll go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 12. It says, where, where, I mean, where do you think that that's being taken away? <clears throat> In Matthew 13, this is obviously dealing with the par there's a parable of the sower, the parable of the tares. Um, but this is, all, this is where he's talking about why he's speaking to people in parables, okay? Um, but notice what it says here in verse 12. It says, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. So the question you have to ask yourself is what's being taken away, okay? So whoever hath not shall be taken away even that which he uh, hath. So, it kind of seems like it's a, not a logical sentence, right? You're kind of thinking like, well, if he doesn't have it, how are you taking it away, <laughs> you know? Um, but it says, therefore, in verse uh, 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So you can definitely understand how that applies to Isaiah 44, right? And the fact that they're not seeing, he shut their eyes, all this, right? But the thing is, is that in another place in the Bible, it says, and it says, to him that hath shall be given, and him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he seemeth to have. Okay? Because everybody in this world has the ability to believe, right? You know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the idea there is the fact that they have faith, but what are they putting it in? Okay? A lot of people have faith in other things. Does that make sense? They, they, have, they trust in their good works. They trust in idols. They trust in this. And basically what it's stating is that these, there, some of these people that aren't hearing, that are hardened, because he gets into that, that these people have, you know, been hard-hearted hard and their eyes have been darkened, so lest they should believe and be saved. And the idea here is that he's taking away, you know, those that have not shall be taken away even that which they have. And I believe this is talking about the ability to believe. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, reprobate concerning the faith. So when it says that deliver me from any unreasonable or wicked men, for all men have not faith. I believe that's what it's talking about. I believe you're talking about people that have been taken away that which they have. Okay? That which they, it was given to every man. Okay? That measure of faith that was given to every man, that's taken away. And that's why, you know, when he's saying that you need to be gentle and you need to be a minister of God, you know, to, to win people to Christ, it's, talk, it's talking about that in 2 Timothy. But it says, per adventure... God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth. The idea there is that there's certain people that God will not allow that. Okay? And that's where the, that's where the Calvinists are going to jump in and be like, see? You know, how do you answer that? Well, here's the difference. That person had the ability at one time. Okay? It's not that he never gave them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's the fact that there's a point where he will no longer. And for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened, and a taste of the heavenly gift, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance. There's certain people that it's impossible to do that, and God is not allowing it anymore. And he's cutting it off. He's taking it away. Okay. So, anyway, you're like, you th I thought you were done with the reprobate doctrine. Well, Isaiah 44 popped up, and, you know, there's a verse in there. So, uh, and here's the thing. Like I said, that doctrine, once you understand that doctrine, it's everywhere. Okay? You can't get past Genesis without seeing that doctrine all over the place. And so 
Uh, it's just over and over and over again that's being brought up because it's just something that is a biblical doctrine that's all over the place. And so, you know, I, I never brought that verse up when we were talking about it because, like I said, it, for all the places that it's in, it would take too long to go to all the places it talks about it. Uh, but going back to Isaiah 44, Isaiah 44 and verse 21 here, it says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So this is a great passage here, because first of all, notice that it says that uh, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Okay. And so this is great because it's basically God saying, I will never forget about you. Okay. Well, uh, I want you to go to Isaiah 49, but think about uh, Nahum chapter 1, and verse 7. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Right. And so the idea is that God knows us, and you want him to know you, right? Because you don't want him to say, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, right? And so if he says, I never knew you, you know what that means? That he's forgotten about you. But what God is promising here is says, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. That means he's always going to remember you. And you remember uh, the thief on the cross? Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And so you can understand where he's coming from. Is like, don't forget about me, you know, remember me. And God is saying, Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. And notice what it says in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49 and verse uh, uh, 14 there. Isaiah 49 and verse 14, it says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. That's strong. I mean, think about that. A mother with her sucking child. It says, they might forget their sucking child, but he's like, I won't forget you. That's how strong that is. And he's, he's, just, he's showing you a strong illustration that if a, if a mother's not going to forget about their sucking child, then how much, you know, he's like, they may forget. It's possible for them to forget, but I won't forget. Okay. And notice, keep reading there, it says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. That's strong. So I just want you to, to realize that when you get saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. And you're in Jesus' hand. No man's able to pluck you out of his hand. He will in no wise cast you out. Jesus is in the Father's hand, and no man's able to pluck, you, pluck, me out, you know, pluck you out of the Father's hand. And so, and he's saying, I'll never forget you. I'll never forget about you, and you're graven on my hands. So, just so many ways that God is stating, you know, you're not going to be lost, right? You're not going to die. You'll never die. You'll live forever. You have everlasting life. Just over and over again, just all these different ways of stating. And even here, he's liking it unto having a child, right? And we're, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And you know what? The mother may forget her sucking child, but he will not forget his children. That's what he's stating here. I, they may forget, but I won't forget my children. And, and also the fact that he's like, I have you graven on the palms of my hands. And now in Isaiah 44, he, he continues on to say, hey, I'm not going to forget you. But notice what it says in verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So this is another way that God is explaining what he's doing with our sins, right? So there's, there's a lot of passages where it talks about how he throws his sins behind his back. It talks about how he's going to cast our sins into the depths of the sea. It talks about how our sins are as far, our transgressions are as far as the east is from the west. And you know, how he's going to remember them no more. We've been washed. Our sins, we've been washed by the blood of the lamb. You know, our sins have been washed completely. We have no sin because his seed remaineth in us. And, he, and we cannot sin because we're born of God. Like all these different illustrations. But here we have, hey, by the way, here's another illustration. I blotted them out like a thick cloud. 
Okay, kind of like how God's going to blot out the sun, you know, and darken the sun, and the the idea of just completely blotting it out. And so I, I love this because it's just giving you another way, another illustration as far as what he's doing with our sins. Go to uh, Isaiah 43, just the back of chapter there, because we see that same terminology as, as far as him blotting out our transgressions. Um, chapter 44 is kind of giving an illustration of what that's like and done to, right? And it says in verse uh, 25, so Isaiah 43, verse 25, it says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. So again, you see this, he's not going to remember our sins, our sins, and iniqu- uh, our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. Like just over and over again, these same thoughts that are going through, I will never forget thee, I'll never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know, the Lord is my helper. You know, all that stuff that, that's just all throughout the Bible. But I love this passage because it, it does explain it in a different way. You know, Micah is the one where it talks about him casting our uh, sins into the sea, Micah 7, and then, you know, just other places that it's just cool to have all of that, you know, to just know where all these verses are at and know, you know, just the different ways that God explains how he's taking care of our sins. Um, notice in uh, go to chapter uh, 44 again there, in verse 23, because he just got, the saying, got, got <laughs> done saying that he blotted out our transgressions and our sins, and, uh, and then it says, uh, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. And you can imagine how it is done. You know, when he died on the cross, and then he, he was buried, and he rose again, and that's how he paid for our sins. That's, that's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. That's how he purchased our salvation. That's how he paid for our sins. And when he rose again, he had the keys of hell and of death. Okay? And there's this victory that's there that he's blotted out our transgressions, he has redeemed us, and he's saying, you know, return unto me, I have redeemed thee. And Isaiah 43, and verse 26, right after he's saying blotted out, it says, put me in remembrance, let us plead together, declare thou that thou mayest be justified. And the idea is that I've saved you from your sins, you need to, you know, come unto me. And, And the idea is that obviously after we get saved, we're supposed to be fellowshipping with him and coming unto him. And, you know, having that, that fellowship, walking in the light, if you will, with the Lord. Um, but we see this rejoicing in verse 23 of uh, chapter 44. It says, The Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains. O forest and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Okay. So you can definitely see how this would be talking about, uh, you know, how Jesus paid for our sins. He blotted out our sins as, with a, as a cloud, a thick cloud. Um, he talks about how he's redeemed Jacob, but he's glorified himself, right? I mean, the whole point of when he says that the comforter can't come until he's glorified, you know, when he's glorified, and what is that talking about? He's risen from the dead and he's in a glorified body, okay? So he's glorified himself in Israel. And so we're talking about that. Now go to John chapter 16, John chapter 16, to just show you that, that there's going to be this rejoicing. And that's what it's talking about here is that there's going to be this shout, there's going to be singing, uh, you know, for uh, the fact that the Lord had done it. And it says in John 16 and verse 20, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And he's talking about the fact that a little while, you know, yet a little while I'm with you, and I should, you know, and he's basically going back and forth how I'm going to be with you. And then you're not going to see me, but then you're going to see me, and then I'm going to go on to the Father, right? He's, and he's being a little cryptic in what he's saying, and they're just like, we don't know what he said, you know? And they're, they're going back and forth on that. But he's basically stating, hey, you're going to be mourning, obviously, because he's going to die. But then you're going to have joy, and that joy no man taketh from you. Uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 44, and verse 24. Isaiah 44 and verse 24, it says, Thus saith the Lord, 
Thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, and turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. So this is, this is great here, because it, he's basically talking about, I'm your Redeemer, but by the way, I'm also the Lord that frustrates the tokens of the liars. Now, what's tokens? Uh, tokens, a lot of times, is talking about signs or wonders, okay? Um, that, or, you know, kind of uh, miracles, if you will. And basically taking all the signs of the liars, he frustrated them. And it says, make it diviners mad, okay? So he's making them crazy. Okay, it's not mad like angry, like mad like nuts, you know, beside themselves. He turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. Okay? And there's a few verses that, or a couple of verses that come to my mind to, to begin with. It talks about uh, you know, these people becoming vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, it says in Romans 1. But go to the, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19. And it just shows you that you, know, you see these people especially in uh, government. People that are, are supposed to be very intelligent, they, they, they graduate from Harvard, you know, from Princeton, you know, like these people have these high educations, right? And I'm not doubting that they probably, you know, studied a lot and learned a lot of information, but they are big, dumb animals. Like, I mean, they just lack any type of reason, logic, or anything like that. And you see these people that are in Congress or that, or the president of the United States, you know, whatever the case may be, that, you know, they may, be, they may have been wise in their life when they were coming up and learning all this knowledge, but God has turned it into foolishness. He has literally made them fools. And you see this with, you know, people that are uh, evolutionists. And, you know, like, who's that, Neil deGrasse Tyson? I mean, this guy literally thinks we're in a matrix. Like, this is supposed to be one of those, you know, he's like an astrophysicist, right? And everybody likes him because he's like fun and all this stuff or whatever. Uh, but this guy literally thinks that we're in a matrix. He's like, well, then that, you know, that matrix may be in another matrix. And he's like getting all excited about it. And I'm like, you've read too many like science fiction novels. You, you need to stop watching the matrix, you know. Neo's not the one. And, uh, and just, you know, these people go down these rabbit holes they're just like you know you know uh, why time for tra travel can exist because of gravity You're like what in the world are you talking about and just stuff like that 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 just goes they go off the rocker you know they're mad it make their diviners mad and it talks about the fact that he uh it says that he make it the no their knowledge foolish and what does it say here in first corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19 it says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So what's he doing? He's taking their knowledge, he's making their knowledge foolish. You know, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so the people that are the, the, regarded in this world as the, the wisest people in the world, like Richard Dawkins, uh, you know, Stephen Hawkins, who's dead now, uh, just other people, I don't, I can't think off the top of my head. These, these, you know, people that are uh, regarded really highly in the world as far as being very intelligent. Um, these people are ultimately God has turned their wisdom into foolishness. I mean, they're just spouting off foolishness and just no logic with what they're saying. And people are just like, oh, that's so good. That's so good. That's so that's so intelligent. And they'll be spouting off all these big words and, you know, their vocabulary is up here and they're talking about all this crazy stuff that's going on, but they're literally out in left field. They're literally out in, like off the rocker with what they're trying to prove and trying to say. They're not in reality. Super strings theory and the Big Bang theory and all this stuff, it's like it doesn't, it doesn't match up with uh, thermodynamics. It doesn't match up with anything like that, but yet doesn't, you know, they're, they're just like, and everybody's just like, oh, yeah, it's good, it's so good. They're so smart. They're fools. Yeah. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And you know what? God made them that way. You know, they rejected God. God rejects them. And their foolish heart was darkened. And they became fools. And it is what it is. Now, uh, the last thing that I want you to see here in the last part of the chapter here is dealing with Cyrus. 
Okay, so here's actually a, a prophecy about King Cyrus of Persia in Isaiah. Isaiah 44 and verse 26, it says, That confirmeth the word of his servants, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to, to, to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be, uh, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now you can only imagine that when Isaiah was preaching this, people were like, what are you talking about? Because in Isaiah's day, the temple was there. Okay? The temple wasn't destroyed. It was there. The, the Jerusalem wasn't in decay. Right? And so you can imagine, like, Cyrus, who's Cyrus, you know? It's like, in a, uh, you know, the prophet that prophesied about Josiah coming, like, hundreds of years before he ever came, Josiah the king. And the same thing here is that this is uh, way before uh, they're even taken captive, let alone after the captivity when Cyrus comes in. And it's talking about how Cyrus is going to, you know, basically lay the foundation of the, the, the temple, right, or the house of God. Um, now, he doesn't physically do it himself, but he gives the commandment. And go to Ezra chapter 1. This last thing I'll show you here. We're way past time. Good night. Not way past. That clock is so fast that it makes me think that I'm way past. But I'm probably way past. All right, you don't have to turn there. Basically, it talks about Cyrus and the first year of King Cyrus. He makes a decree to build the temple of God. And that's what happens. They lay the foundation. And, uh, and so, I, man, I, I thought... I, I must be seeing things. I thought that, that hand was on the other side, and it's not. So uh, we'll stop with that. Um, actually, Cyrus is mentioned in the next chapter at the beginning, so we'll get to Cyrus later. So let's end with a word of prayer to the Heavenly Father. We thank you for today, and thank you for your word, and just pray that you would uh, be with us throughout the rest of this week. We thank you for the book of Isaiah and just all the truths that we can go into and all the different things that we can see going through this book. And Lord, just pray that you'd help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, we love you. Pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.